In keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. Therefore, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege to assemble ourselves together under the principle of freedom so that we might learn the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us and give us the concentration necessary to assemble this portion of the Word into our souls. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6, verse 23. Matthew 6, 23. And here we're dealing with the correct mental attitude, the mental attitude that we should have. And in 623, this is the corrected translation, but if your eye is ugly, this means you have a lack of inner beauty from knowing the Word of God, from using Operation Z, from being filled with God the Holy Spirit, that is for us in this age. And that will result in a lack of inner beauty when you neglect the Word of God or reject the Word of God. But if your eye is ugly, your whole body will be full of darkness. This is a reference to being out of fellowship. When the believer is out of fellowship, he walks in darkness and imitates the unbeliever. And if you are out of fellowship, functioning under carnality, excuse me, you act no different than an unbeliever. <clears throat> and you cannot tell the difference between a carnal believer and an unbeliever. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Now this is uh, dealing with something called a fortiori, with stronger reason. And what Christ is saying is, when you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're under the concept of light. Yet, when you live in carnality, you're under darkness. So then, how great is that darkness? Uh, because it's overcoming the light. You see, when you believe in Christ, you receive light. But when you're in carnality and under sin, you are under darkness. So this is a fortiori. Uh, since the light is in you, when you are in darkness, in carnality, how great is that darkness? With stronger reason, it's very great. And that's because, well, this is showing that for a believer to go into carnality, well, you have to break boundaries. You have to break boundaries that the unbeliever does not have. The unbeliever constantly lives and functions under the old sin nature. But when we function under the old sin nature, we have to break a boundary. And when we are filled with God the Holy Spirit, and then... Uh, we make the choice to sin after we're tempted, we are breaking a boundary because when we are filled with God the Holy Spirit, we are able not to sin. But we choose to sin. Actually, we're not able not to sin. We're going to sin. But when you're filled with God the Holy Spirit, you're not under sin. And in order to fall under carnality, it takes uh, you to break some boundaries. So how great is that darkness for the carnal believer? And one way to know if people are in carnality is when they neglect or reject the Word of God. That's a definite sign because the filling of God the Holy Spirit makes you yearn for the Word of God. Uh, Matthew chapter 6 verse 24. No one is able to serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. No one is able to serve God and mammon. What is mammon? Well, mammon is the Chaldean god of money. And if you have money lust, this is what Christ is saying. If you have money lust, you are not fulfilling your spiritual life. That doesn't mean to have a normal desire to go out and work and make a living so that you can feed your belly. We're talking about lust for money. When you worry about money, you are not fulfilling your spiritual life. Life. And usually, when you have a lust for money, this originates from worry that has overrun your soul. You're worried about things going on in your life, and you think money can solve the problem. So you've converted the outside pressure of adversity into the inside pressure of stress in the soul. 
because you have not used the ten problem-solving devices. You've not used the faith rest drill. You're not filled with God the Holy Spirit. Instead of having the thinking of Christ, you spend your whole life perseverating, thinking about money, how to gain money, how to earn money. And you think that is the end all in life, and it's not. Your God has become mammon. You might as well worship the Chaldean God of money. That's what Christ is saying to us. Then in chapter 6, verse 25, Because of this I say to you, do not worry about your life as to what you will eat or drink or what you will wear. Isn't there more to life than food and more to the body than what we wear on it? And the answer is yes. And especially for us in the church age, we have a unique spiritual life to live. We have a unique spiritual life that is available to every believer when you believe in Christ. And this wasn't even available during the time that our Lord was on the earth. Our Lord was actually executing the prototype, yet the protocol was not yet available to anyone. So instead of having the thinking of Christ, what you do is spend your whole life worrying about money. And we have far above and beyond what we could ever ask or think. And those things are spiritual things. They don't deal with money. They don't deal with things. Now you might be thinking that if you had the right kind of car, it would bring you happiness. It would for about a week and then it would get old to you, and it would wear out just like any Christmas gift does. And when you uh, get a game to play on the PlayStation, well, you're excited about it at first, but after a day or so, it wears off, and you never finish playing the game. And that's because uh, those things are temporary solutions, and they're not really solutions. Uh, they're just stimulants. Uh, but we have far above and beyond what we could ever ask or think in spiritual matters. Chapter 6, verse 26. Look at the birds of the sky. They do not plant, harvest, or gather into barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you more valuable than they are? This is really a condemnation of the person who is a workaholic. Because they always plant, they always harvest, they're always trying to gather into barns, and they work themselves half to death. Now work is definitely essential. And the Apostle Paul would even work with his hands during the time that he would teach. But he didn't worry about money. And when he was out of money, yes, he worked with his hands to make some, but he didn't worry about it. And he definitely didn't uh, go nuts about it and have a worry in his soul. Instead, he left it in the Lord's hands. And he did what he could in terms of work. But other than that, he just relaxed. And on his time off, he relaxed. He didn't worry. He didn't think about these things, how to gain more money, how to make ends meet, although we all have to. Uh, the, the thing is, don't go overboard with it. And if you do... Well, you're serving the God of mammon rather than God the Father. So he's really coming down hard on the Pharisees and the hypocrites because all of them are interested in money. And they are, uh, most of them, have that weakness in terms of money. And that's why later on we'll see Jesus Christ overturn money changers in the temple. That's because they had become too concerned with money rather than teaching the word of God. And that's the way most people are today. They want everyone to tithe in the church. And they want everyone in the church to hand over their money because that's what they perseverate on. But the fact is we have no need to worry about money because Christ says so. Because of this I say to you, do not worry about your life. That's 625. And then in 626, he gives us a, 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 another a fortiori concept. And a fortiori, again, means from the Latin, with greater reason. So it is with stronger reason that if God the Father feeds the birds, then how much more are we valuable than the birds? And how much more will he feed us? If God the Father feeds the bird, it stands with stronger reason he's going to feed us. We're worth more than a bird. Birds don't even have a soul. 
Therefore, when you worry, you are insulting God because God's going to take care of you. And this is what Christ is saying. Why are you worrying about your life? Why are you worrying about what you're going to eat tomorrow, what you're going to wear? Why are you worrying about accumulating wealth? For I tell you, isn't, uh, doesn't the bird who doesn't even work, the bird doesn't work, but isn't he fed? Yes. So with stronger reason, how much more will God the Father feed you? It takes you out of the equation. You thought you were so great because you were a workaholic and you weren't that great at all. You should have just been resting on the Lord. Now it doesn't permit you to be lazy because the Apostle Paul himself uh, tells us if we don't work, we don't eat. And that's a principle of life. And we have to work. And when we have a job, we must do it as unto the Lord. And therefore, we receive payment. But even that job is given to us by God. And if we simply follow his mandates to work as unto the Lord, we'll always be fed and clothed. And those times when we are lacking are those times of testing. 627. Can any of you add time to your life by worrying? That's a rhetorical question, and the answer is no. When you worry and you say, I think I might die uh, before I'm 18 or whatever, uh, well, can you add time to your life by worrying? And you worry about it. And you worry about your health or worry about something else. And it's not going to add time to your life. If anything, worry reduces. Your lifespan, actually, it's definitely proven that worry reduces your lifespan. And if you function your whole life under worry, you will die younger than you would normally have because that would be part of God's punishment. And worry can create all kind of health problems, ulcers. You could uh, break out in rashes. And in fact, it makes you age very quickly if you always function under worry. And eventually it will wear out your body and you will die the sin face to face with death if you always function under worry. So can any of you add time to your life by worrying? No, but you must certainly can shorten it. 628. Why worry about clothing? Think about the lilies of the field, how they grow. They do not work or spin now this was something that they could all understand because the lily is a very beautiful fat flower and the lilies were all over Israel. The lilies were a common flower in Israel and they could see how beautiful they were and they were clothed with great beauty yet they do not work or spin. And then in chapter 6 verse 29 Yet I say to you that Solomon Now he brings up King Solomon because King Solomon is used as a point of reference for the Jews. Because all the Jews there know about King Solomon. They know about his tremendous wealth. They all learned about the story of King Solomon when they were children. And their parents would teach them about King Solomon. And how much tremendous wealth he had. And how glamorous he was. And that's because Solomon was blessed by association with his father. Who is Solomon's father? King David. King David was a man after God's own heart. And because he was, Solomon, his son, was blessed tremendously. And, and the concept of blessing by association. And so he was always well-dressed. Very colorful clothing. Which was something that was admired in, in those days. So you remember the story of the, the coat of many colors. Well, that is an indication of wealth or rank or prosperity. And so Solomon always had a very bright, colorful clothing. Yet the lilies of the field are clothed more than Solomon. So yet I say to you that Solomon, in all his glamour, was not clothed like one of these. So again, it's a fortiori. If God will clothe the lilies of the field, how much more so will he clothe you? With stronger reason, since you have a soul and the lilies of the field definitely do not, you definitely will be clothed by your Father in heaven. All of this is dealing with the logistical grace support, a basic doctrine. Yet so many people get so hung up on that and they think that uh, they need to worry all the time. And they think that they're going to provide from their own worry. And yet... Uh, 
You can't do anything with worry. Worthy, worry is a waste of energy. You can't change a thing by worrying. And if you worry because you're short, you can't grow an inch because of it. And if you uh, worry because you don't have money and you're doing the best you can in your job, well, uh, don't worry about it. Aren't you more valuable than a bird? Yes, you are. Aren't you more valuable than a lily? Of course you are. That's a fortiori, with stronger reason. 630. Since God clothes the flowers of the field in this way, which are here today and shriveled up tomorrow, won't he clothe you even more, you people of little faith? O oh, ye of little faith. He's lambasting all of these religious people for worrying. They thought there was nothing wrong with worry. They thought it was a normal function of life. And yet it is not. For us as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are to live lives of tranquility, not lives of worry. So stop worrying about things. So now we come under the concept of the faith rest drill in chapter 6, verse 31. So then, don't worry saying... What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? Then in 632, uh, we have again the mention of the Gentiles. For the Gentiles keep scrounging for these things. Again, he's comparing the religious people to Gentiles, and they hate that. And they hate it when our Lord keeps calling them Gentiles. They keep thinking to themselves, he keeps saying that over and over again, I don't like that. They don't like it because it was stepping on their toes. So once again, he's using the religious people's idea of racial superiority and telling them that they are no better than Gentiles. You all worry just like Gentiles do. Now you think you're going to heaven because Abraham is your father, but you worry just like a Gentile. You haven't even believed in me, so you're all going to hell is what he's been telling them. So Christ constantly mentions Gentiles and compares the Jews to the Gentiles in order to wear down that racism that had been ingrained in them since childhood. They always thought of themselves as Jews as being superior to the Gentiles, and they were not. And Christ keeps saying, look, you're just like the Gentiles. You're sinners just like a Gentile. You worry just like a Gentile. You do all sorts of things related to the sin nature just like the Gentiles do. It's insulting to them. So for the Gentiles keep scrounging for these things, yet your heavenly Father has always known that you need them. So God the Father has always known when we are in need of something and he always comes through and provides for us for we are his children. Chapter 6, verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God. Now this is referring to the sum total of doctrine that they could receive at that time. And by way of application to us, even though this was an application to them at a different dispensation, it can be applied to us in that when we have the sum total of doctrine that we can receive today, we are seeking first the kingdom of heaven. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Now this righteousness is not the imputed righteousness. Of course, we know that when we believe in Christ, we receive imputed righteousness. But this righteousness is referring to a capacity righteousness. This righteousness in the Greek is called dikaio sune a capacity righteousness. And in those days, they received capacity righteousness through the use of the faith rest drill. That was the optimum of their spiritual life. Maximum use of the faith rest drill. And they would use the faith rest drill and from that receive a capacity righteousness. Today, we receive capacity righteousness from consistent utilization of the two power options. I hope you remember what they are. The two power options are the filling of God the Holy Spirit plus Operation Z. Operation C is perception, metabolization, and application of Bible doctrine. So seek ye first the kingdom of God and his capacity righteousness, and all the details of life will be supplied to you for your benefit. So there's no need to worry about anything. Never 
When you worry about anything in life, you are insulting God Almighty. And you are telling God, well, you didn't really know I was going to go through this problem, God, so I need to go solve this problem myself. And yet God knew about the problem way before you did, and God provided the solution for those problems in the 10 problem-solving devices. So you should know those. Rebound, the filling of God, the Holy Spirit, the faith rest drill in four categories. Grace and doctrinal orientation, a personal sense of destiny, personal love for God the Father, impersonal love for all mankind, plus eight, sharing the happiness of God, and occupation with the person of Christ. Those are the ten problem-solving devices, and those things solve problems, not worry. So when you leave it in the Lord's hands, he will take care of it. And when you seek the kingdom of God first, when you live your life in the light of eternity, all the details of life will be added unto you. You're a child of God. Of course, he's going to give you the things that you need in life. So don't worry about it. And this is what he says again, repeating himself in chapter 6, verse 34. And this will wrap up uh, the chapter 6 before we move on to chapter 7 which is a completely different subject so chapter 6 34 so then do not worry about tomorrow don't worry about tomorrow don't perseverate on tomorrow don't keep running the events of tomorrow through your mind because it doesn't really matter because you don't even know what's going to occur anyway because tomorrow will take care of itself today has enough trouble of its own. And that is definitely true. And this is the concept of living one day at a time. And there's a beautiful song that says one day at a time. And that's how we should live, one day at a time. Day after day, uh, simply uh, living our spiritual life and don't even worry about tomorrow because uh, none of us are really guaranteed tomorrow. We could all die in our sleep tonight or the rapture could occur in about 30 minutes and we would all go meet the Lord in the air. And some people would have wished they had been there, to, been here today instead of facing shame, which they will if they don't get serious about the word of God, instead of putting it number two, number three, number four on their scale of values or number 10, or wherever it is, it should always be number one. And if it's not number one on your scale of values, when you do, when the resurrection does occur, whenever that will be, you will shrink away in shame because you didn't make the choice to follow in Christ's footsteps. And it's very easy because, as I told you, he's already walked through the deep snow for us, and all we have to do is follow in his footsteps. And that means to simply come to Bible class, listen to his word, and grow in grace. Very simple. But when you're distracted, when the weeds of life, the weeds of, uh, well, uh, mammon, uh, they start to worship money, and, or, or they start to worship entertainment. And these weeds of distraction come up and strangle them from the word of God. That's for those who neglect it. For those who reject it, they have a completely different problem. For those who reject it, they're just plain arrogant. They already think they know it all, and yet they know nothing of grace, and they've never really studied scripture enough to know anything about it. So this is the concept in 634 of living one day at a time. And as Christians, we're designed to live one day at a time. We're not designed to be living today and worrying about tomorrow. And we're not designed to be living today and worrying about anything. God will provide. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and all these details of life will be added unto you. So don't worry about the details. Now in chapter 7, verse 1, we get to something else that really, really gets on the nerves of the religious crowd because they've spent their whole life judging people. So we're moving to the concept of do not judge. Do not judge other people. There is a description of three people in chapter 7. Verse, or three t different types of people. Verses 1 through 5 describe the carnal believer, that is, the believer out of fellowship under sin. Verses 6 through 12 describe the mature believer. And verses 13 through 27 describe the unbeliever. Once again, verses 1 through 5, the carnal believer. Verses 6 through 12, 
the mature believer. Verses 13 through 27, the unbeliever. Now chapter 7, verse 1. Stop judging and you will not receive divine judgment. This is re the corrected translation. And this is referring to the carnal believer. Stop judging. In other words, stop doing what you have been doing. Stop judging people, carnal believer. Stop judging and you will not receive divine judgment. Verse 2. For by which standard you judge, you will be judged and the measure, measure you use will be measured back to you. For by which standard you judge, you will be judged, and the measure you use will be measured back to you. This means that when you are a carnal believer, and you have been judging, gossiping, maligning, and judging others, you will be punished for, first of all, this is actually dealing with triple compound discipline, which we've studied in the past. First of all, you are punished for the sin of gossip, maligning, or judging, whichever one you've been involved in, probably all three. So you're judged for those sins. And then you are judged for the sin that you've named concerning the other person. And you might say, uh, that person's just a drunk. Well, maybe they are. So you say and judge them and say to someone else, uh, so-and-so across the street is nothing but a drunk. So you've just committed a sin of gossip, a sin of maligning, and a sin of judging. And you've also committed a sin. Well, actually, what occurs then is after you do that, you've named their sins, so you receive the punishment of their sin if they've committed it. And if they haven't committed that sin, you still receive the punishment of it. Maybe they're not a drunk. Maybe they just have a social drink, uh, uh, maybe once a night, two glasses of wine, which would be just fine. And so they all say, he's just a drunk. And then what happens is, if it's not true, you receive the judgment of drunkenness. And the per other person you've been judging gets, receives blessing. But if it's true and they are a drunk, you receive the judgment of their drunkenness while they have the punishment removed and it's all put on you because when you judge someone you are saying step out of the way God I'll handle this person you are being very blasphemous and very arrogant and yet people do it all the time Christians do it the most they do it more than unbelievers it's a sad thing to note because Christians think they are so holy and so righteous that they have a right to judge other people, and yet Jesus Christ makes it clear. And these same people uh, wear bracelets that say, what would Jesus do? And yet they don't even know Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Stop judging! That's what they all do in all the churches around here, in most of them anyway. This would be one exception, and I don't know of any more, but there might be. For uh, stop judging, and you will not receive divine judgment. For by which standard you judge, that is, you name the sin of a drunkenness, for example. Or you name the sin, you say, well, that person's a homosexual. Well, you don't want to receive the judgment for homosexuality, but if you name it, <coughs> excuse me, but if you name that sin, you will receive that judgment. For by which standard you judge, you will be judged, and the measure you use will be measured back to you. And this is the concept of triple compound discipline. Anytime you judge someone else, the discipline you receive for judging someone is three times worse than the overt sins. Chapter 7, verse 3. Why do you scrutinize the splinter in your brother's eye? but fail to evaluate, and this is from the Greek, and it means, but you fail to evaluate by the standard of the Word of God, the log in your own eye. Why do you scrutinize the splinter in your brother's eye, but fail to evaluate the log in your own eye? Or why do you say to your brother, let me pull the splinter out of your eye while there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite! Well, he's stepping all over their toes again. I mean, there are people there who spent their whole lives gossiping, judging, and maligning others. 
And there are people there who consider themselves very religious, and they are very religious, and they consider themselves very holy, and they think they have a right to judge everyone else. And then Christ comes along and says, you have a log in your own eye. You don't have the right to be picking at splinters out of other people's eyes. You hypocrite! You hypocrite! First, remove the beam from your eye. Now, how do you remove the beam? as it is trans correctly translated. You name your sin and disregard it. It's the concept of 1 John 1, 9. When you remove the beam from your eye, you name your sins to God, you name that sin of gossip, you name that sin of judging, you name that sin of maligning, and then uh, you will be forgiven. Then it goes on to say, and then you can see clearly to remove the splinter from your brother's eye. Now, this isn't uh, telling them to uh, go ahead and be nosy in other people's lives. What he's actually using is a, a, a language. He's using a simple, it's a simple use of language describing the mental attitude sins as being worse than the overt sins. You see, the mental attitude sins are described as a log. The overt sins are described as a splinter. So it's a simple use of language showing all the religious people that their sins are worse than the sins that they've always been picking on. Worse than. It is not a command for them to stick their noses into other people's business so that after they rebound, uh, they'll go around and, try, and then try to pick the splinter out of their brother's eye. Now, that is incorrect. What it is actually saying is, hey, look, your sins are worse. You have a log in your eye. Rem first remove the log. And when they remove the log, they will not even uh, care to think about uh, uh, trying to remove the speck from everyone else's eye. But some of these people were teachers of the law, you have to remember. And as teachers of the law, they would always teach, don't do this and don't do that. Excuse me, I have to sneeze again, I think. Anyway... As uh, teachers of the law, they always uh, go on and say, uh, don't do this, don't do that, don't commit a fornication, which is true, and don't commit adultery, which is true, and don't commit this and that, which is an overt sin, which would be correct. But then uh, Jesus uh, g comes along and says, well, you're, you're worse, you are committing the worst sins with your mental attitude sins. And so, uh, when you get up and teach now that you've learned something, well, teach against the mental attitude sins along with the overt sins. In other words, you'll be able to teach it correctly. So it's just a matter of language. Chapter 7, verse 6. Now, this is a totally different concept. We're moving away from judgment for now and moving on to a different concept. Do not give what is holy. What is holy? That's, uh, for us, it would be our unique spiritual life. Do not give what is holy, the unique spiritual life, to dogs. Now, that's, of course, not literal, but what do, does dogs refer to? Dogs refers to the Old Testament title for unbelieving Gentiles. In other words, when you go out and witness, don't, tell them about the angelic conflict. When you go out and witness, uh, don't tell them about the ten problem-solving devices. That is holy. These are things that can only be spiritually discerned. What you do is give them the gospel. You can't even teach them the Trinity, really. Uh, you can't go up to someone who is unspiritual, unsaved, and teach them how the Trinity is uh, like an egg, and it has three parts, yet it is one. They still won't understand it because it is spiritually discerned. But what you can tell them, since this is what Jesus Christ, or what God the Holy Spirit makes effective, is that they can believe in Christ and be saved. And you can lay down the foundation and say, you are imperfect, God is perfect. In order to have a relationship with a perfect God, you must uh, believe in Jesus Christ, who is the mediator. 
And Jesus Christ is the mediator between man and God. He died as a substitute for your sins. Therefore, believe in Christ and you'll be saved. And uh, they might come back and say, well, what about the angelic conflict? And you come back and say, listen, your righteous deeds are as filthy rags. What you need to do is believe in Christ. You think you've been living such a good life? You haven't. It's not good enough because God is perfect. So you must believe in Christ in order to be saved. And when they want to pick an argument over doctrinal subjects, don't do it. Do not give what is holy, the word of God, the unique spiritual life. Of course, you give the water of the word, which is the gospel. But you can't give an unbeliever even the milk of the word, and definitely not the, the meat of the word. You must give them the water of the word, which is the gospel message. Do not give what is holy, the unique spiritual life, to dogs. Old Testament title for unbelieving Gentiles. Or throw your pearls before swine. Swine, of course, are pigs. Or throw your pearls before pigs. This is an Old Testament title for Jewish unbelievers. The Jewish unbelievers were called pigs in the Old Testament. The Gentile unbelievers in the Old Testament were called dogs. So do not throw pearls before pigs, Jewish unbelievers. And it's the same concept. Don't give them the spiritual life. Give them the gospel. Otherwise, they will trample them under their feet and turn around and tear you to, to pieces. Now, this is what legalists do. This is what religion does. Religion always seeks to destroy you and to destroy doctrine. So in witnessing, simply give the gospel. Do not fall into arguments on doctrinal points. The unspiritual cannot understand that which is spiritual. Therefore, as part of knowing how to witness, when you witness to someone, simply give it to them straight, the gospel. And every time they try to argue with you on a doctrinal point, I've had this happen to me. Somebody had heard about the angelic conflict, yet they may not even be saved. They may be. I don't know. But they said, what about this angelic conflict? It makes no sense. Why would God do all of that? And I simply said, look, your righteous deeds are as filthy rags. You're not good enough to get into heaven. You're not perfect. God is perfect. You need to believe in Christ. So they would think about it a minute and then come up with another issue from doctrine. That's something that we know, but we know it because we're spiritual. And they heard these things as unspiritual, so they didn't understand them. So they were confused. And the reason why they were confused is because those people who should have known better and simply given them the gospel, instead uh, gave them uh, a book to read which dealt with doctrinal issues. Or instead, uh, they went up and tried to teach them how to rebound or teach them the unique spiritual life. And so they would think about that and come up with all kind of errors with it because they would, they would, they're not spiritual. They can't understand those things. So the idiots who gave that to this person, well, they confused him very much. Now, whether he would have believed in Christ or not, well, that's yet to be seen. But what you do is give the gospel and constantly give the gospel. And every time they want to argue a point, and you might know all the doctrine about it, don't worry about it. Simply give them the gospel. Simply make it clear to them they're sinners, just like you are and everyone else is, and they're in need of a Savior, and they need to believe in Christ, and no matter how good they are, no matter what good works they do in life, it's not going to get them into heaven. They must simply believe in Christ, and that is how you witness. So now we move on to 7-7 with prayer, doctrine, and the faith rest drill. These things are, these next few verses deal with prayer. They also deal with doctrine and also the use of the faith rest drill. Chapter 7, verse 7. Ask and you will receive. Ask and you will receive. Now this is actually from the Greek a logical pro progression. It's not really referring to a period of time. What it's saying is, it's not saying ask and wait to receive. It's saying ask and you will receive. And it's a logical progression, meaning that because you've asked, you will receive it. Seek, and this is referring to doctrine, seek the word of God. Seek, and you will discover it. Knock, 
utilization of the faith rest drill, and the door will be opened for you. Knock is a reference to the utilization of the faith rest drill. And when you use the faith rest drill, it will be opened for you. That is, doors will be opened for you. You see, you think all the doors have been shut, and your life isn't going as well as you planned. And God doesn't seem to be opening any doors for you. And what this is saying, knock. Use the faith rest drill and a door will be opened. And the faith rest drill is simply cast your cares upon the Lord for he cares for you. And a door will be opened. As long as you are breathing, there is always an ability for a door to be opened. 7, 8. For every believer who asks, receives. And everyone who seeks, finds and to the one who knocks it will be opened and it will be opened by God this is the present active participle and all three indicate habitual activity in phase two what's phase two phase two is your believer you as a believer in time using your spiritual life and the active voice means that your vision, your volition is involved in these activities. To break it down for you, it's saying, look, your volition's involved. When you knock, you're using the faith rest drill. And when you use the faith rest drill from your own free volition, God will open the door. If you don't use the faith rest drill, if you don't live your unique spiritual life, the doors won't be opened. They will be shut in your face and you will be punished. So this is all referring to to, uh, uh, from the Greek, and again, it's the present active participle, which indicates habitual activity. Ha habitual activity of what? Habitual activity of learning the Word of God. Habitual activity of using the faith rest drill. The active voice means your volition is involved. It means you choose to come to church, and then you choose to have self-discipline with regard to the Word of God, even when you don't feel like it. Maybe you have something else you would like to do, but instead you choose to listen to the Word of God. That's habitual activity. In utilization of the faith rest drill, this is you knocking. And if you don't do these things, if you put Bible doctrine on the back burner and say, I'll get around to it when I finish uh, some chores that I need to finish, when you do that, well, you're failing in your spiritual life and God will start to shut doors. You think you're opening doors by what you're doing, by your extreme activity outside of the spiritual life and the energy of your flesh. But you're not. You're really shutting doors right in your face. And if you just relax, well, God would open these doors. Chapter 7, verse 9. What person is there among you whom... If his son asks for bread, will give him a stone. Again, this is use of a fortiori. He's saying, look, you are humans. Well, let's continue. 7.10, or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake. So then, since you who are imperfect, that is, mankind is imperfect, since you, mankind, know how to provide for your children... How much more will your Father in heaven give good, give good gifts to those who ask him? What it's saying is, hey, you're imperfect human beings with sin natures, yet you know how to feed your children. And when your children are hungry and ask you for fish, you don't give them a snake. And when your children are hungry and ask you for bread, you don't give them a stone. And this is with stronger reason, a fortiori again from the Latin with stronger reason, meaning that even if you as imperfect people are going to give to your children, then it stands with greater reason that God is going to give you what you want when you ask for it or what you need, really. He doesn't always give us what we want, and that's a good thing, because if all the believers got what they wanted, the economy would collapse because everyone would be wealthy, and you might not understand that. But the principle is... Uh, let's say every believer in Anderson today, which would be about 80% of them, won the lottery. How many of them would go to work the next day? None of them. So they wouldn't be going to Burger King. You wouldn't be able to get a burger. And they wouldn't be going to their barber shop. And you wouldn't be able to get a haircut. And they wouldn't be going to the airport to fly a plane because they have too much money. They don't need to anymore. So you wouldn't be able to travel. 
and nobody would be working at the gas station. Well, it would result in economic collapse. So then, so that just shows that uh, not everyone can be wealthy, even though Satan's always trying to create perfect environment. There must always be the poor people so that we have people to clean our floors and do such as that. And there must always be rich people. That's just the way it works and the way it's been set up. So then, since you who are imperfect know how to provide for your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? This is the a fortiori with stronger reason. Since mankind who is imperfect, even unbelievers provide for their children, and if an unbeliever can provide for their children, how much more so will God the Father provide for his children? And that would include you and me. Verse 12, therefore in everything, keep on doing to others as you would want them to do for you. For this is the law. We're switching subjects once again. Chapter 7, verse 12, therefore in everything, keep on doing to others as you would want them to do to you. For this is the law. Now this is what is called the golden rule. And it summarizes the complete attitude of the Mosaic Law. However, we must remember that we are not under the Mosaic Law. And the golden rule of grace is, Do unto others as Christ has done for you. This is found in Colossians 3.13. In grace, the believer does not earn or deserve anything from God. And the believer must give on the basis of love and with the filling of God the Holy Spirit. So Matthew here is stating the general principle. Now Luke included Jesus telling them that they would receive the Holy Spirit. This is something that was left out of verse 12 by Matthew. It's not that he didn't say it. It's simply that Matthew just didn't hear that part of it. But Luke did. So actually in 7.12, uh, let me give it to you this way. I'm going to give you something a theologically theological that is uh, rarely taught except uh, by one other person that I know of, uh, and there may be a few more. Now it says in verse 11, right before this verse 12, How much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Now a lot of people have interpreted that as, you ask God for whatever you want and he'll give it to you. But it must line up in accordance with his will. And actually this is referring to something uh, completely outside of uh, food and water. And this is actually dealing with uh, spiritual gifts. And we see that from Luke. Now Matthew doesn't bring this out. But in Luke, uh, Jesus tells them right after he says, have, How will a God the Father, uh, how much more so will he give you good gifts to those who ask him? Then in Luke it goes on to say, Ask then for the filling of God the Holy Spirit. Now this is something that Matthew didn't bring out. But Luke brought it out. And he's saying, Look, your human fathers and mothers give you food. They give you clothing. They give you water. Now, I tell you this. How much more so will your Father in heaven give you what you need? And not only that, he's going to give you something that has never been given before except unto me and uh, John the Baptist, and that is the filling of God the Holy Spirit. And he says, look, now we don't have to ask for the filling of God the Holy Spirit. We receive it because we're church age, but they weren't at this time. And so Jesus is telling his disciples, look, you can ask for God the Holy Spirit, and when you ask for it, you'll receive it. Because with stronger reason, if your parents give you food and give you water so that you can survive, how much more so will our Father in Heaven give you spiritual things such as the filling of God the Holy Spirit? So all you have to do is ask for it and you'll receive it. And this is where it comes from. Now this has been taken out of context uh, because it, that people think it deals with material things. And while they are details of life, and you can pray for some details in life, especially if you're having a hard time with money, you can pray for that. You are not prohibited from it. But, you, of course, uh, what this is saying is you have something greater. 
You have the filling of God, the Holy Spirit, and all the disciples had to do was ask for it. Yet we know from Luke that they never did. They never came around to asking for it and because, well, they didn't understand the significance of the filling of God, the Holy Spirit. So Luke included Jesus telling them they would receive the Holy Spirit if they asked so they could rise into a greater sphere than the law. And right now, you see, he starts off talking about the law. Therefore, in everything, keep on doing to others as you would want them to do for you, for this is the law. But they could have risen above that, above that law, just as we do and can through impersonal love, uh, through the filling of God the Holy Spirit. So we can bring it all together, what Christ was really saying at this moment in front of the crowd, when he says uh, he'll give you good gifts, just ask for them. Actually, he was offering the disciples the filling of God, the Holy Spirit. And all they had to do was ask for it, but they didn't. And that's found in Luke. So therefore, in everything, keep on doing to others as you would want them to do for you, for this is the law and the prophets. Now tomorrow we will deal with the two gates. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to study this portion of your word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us to these things, make them a source of blessing and challenge in our lives. And Father, we pray for our country that if it be your will, continue to hold back the storm clouds of the fifth cycle of discipline. And we pray that you will give our president the wisdom to handle this worldwide war on terror and may you confuse the counsel of our enemies. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.